All right. Good morning. Um, welcome to the last day of the Materials Project workshop. My name is Sean Dwarknoth. I am one of the research scientists in Materials Project and one of the core developers for a lot of the architecture and infrastructure that basically powers the Materials Project. So yesterday, Donnie showed this diagram, which kind of demonstrates all the moving pieces that go into taking calculations and shuffling them all the way through the supercomputer and into the Materials Project website. And you've kind of been learning pieces of this architecture <coughs> yesterday, starting with PyMatGen, which is really where all the material science lives. So this is the base code that lets you do the material science operations like structure transformations, doing things like elasticity analysis, um, trying to build phase diagrams and looking at the band structure. That's really the core purpose of this code. And on its own, you can use it as a way to enable you to do data science for material science. Um, we talked a little bit about MongoDB, uh, if you were here for the primer, and we've talked a little bit about MongoDB in the context of the workshop, or in, co in context of the website, because this is really the way in which we organize all of the data. And by understanding MongoDB, you have some way of accessing kind of the power of filtering through the data the way that we normally would. And this lets you kind of really focus in on the materials or properties that are the most important for whatever application you're trying to engineer for. We're going to actually talk in the next lesson about a code called Atomate. And there's basically a large, um, it, there's a somewhat of a complex task in taking a single calculation and multiplying it to, say, 100,000 calculations. And really, what we do in Atomate is we take our expertise on, say, computing the elastic tensor, and we try to build that into a single workflow function that then one of you could use to actually build the same workflow we use for the work for the website and run that on your own supercomputer or your own you know, computer if you have a VASP license. And the idea here is that you don't really need to know all the full details of how the elastic tensors are enumerated, the deformations are enumerated, and how they come back together, all the analysis is done to make sure this is a valid elastic tensor, but just be able to access this, run the VASP through fireworks, and then look at the output and understand what's coming on the output, but that's the same as what's on the website. And Atomate doesn't just cover simple workflows. Um, it does the base workflows that we use for the materials project band structures, structure optimizations, but you know, Donnie demonstrated the X-ray uh, absorption spectra. All of those workflows are also in Atomate, as well as a number of workflows that are used on a select basis. Um, an example would be we, uh, a defects workflow where you can enumerate charge defects and understand the relative energy or stability of charge defects as a function of the Fermi level. Um, there are workflows to do the adsorbate finding and run those through VAST so you get an idea of relative adsorbate structures um, and what their energies are as a function of adsorbate site. All of this is built into Atomate. Um, and then later on today, you're going to learn about MapMiner. And this is really a code that builds on top of PyMatchN with the intention of enabling data science. So there's a number of people who are today publishing on doing machine learning algorithms for a variety of applications. So elasticity, you know, the total energy of structures, finding adsorbates, uh, band gaps are often common properties that people tend to start with. But the idea is that all of these machine learning tasks kind of are based on the same fundamental steps. It's enumeration of data, cleaning the data, so it's something you can use to train using a variety of algorithms such as you know, support vector machines or random forests to try to train different models, evaluating how well those models work, and coming back and trying to make some decisions on which machine learning model you want to build. And MapMiner takes all of these steps and actually builds on top of scikit-learn so that you can do this without having to know all the nuances of scikit-learn, but gives you access to the material science intuition. So today we're going to go over both those things, and we're going to start in the morning with Atomy, and Eric is going to basically lead the lesson on uh, Atomate workflows this morning. Okay, well, thank you, Sean, for that introduction. Um, let me flip over to the summary slides that we have going on. So uh, as Sean said, my name is Eric Siwong Sai, and I'm currently a grad student in Christine's group. Um, and I'm working uh, a lot with some of the Atomate workflows, specifically things dealing with amorphous things. And I've written a workflow for that. so. Um, that's some of where my uh, knowledge comes from. Um, helping me um, is Anne in the corner, back corner over there. Um, she knows this lesson pretty well in and out, so she can also help you. So if you have any questions or need any help 
please put up your red sticky notes as we've been doing uh, through the rest of this workshop. Um, so just to give you a brief rundown of what we're going to do this lesson, um, we're going to be initializing and running standard Atomate workflows. This is something like an optimization um, calculation in VASP or a band structure calculation. Um, and then we're going to uh, talk about how you manage and view fireworks at a pretty basic level. And then later on, um, Jimmy will talk a little bit more about the more advanced uses of Atomate. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about how you submit jobs to uh, high performance computing um, and how to use fireworks with that. So just to give a little bit of background on what Atomate is, um, Atomate, as Sean mentioned, is kind of a uh, software package that we have written that simplifies running a lot of uh, VASP or a lot of uh, material science calculations. And this is really done on the back of uh, three codes. So we have PyMatGen, um, which you guys have already learned about. Um, and then the second code is called uh, Fireworks, which is a workflow management software. Um, so maybe if I pull up the website, it'll give you a little bit more idea. So Fireworks is more of a management for running different jobs. It's not necessarily um, specifically used for uh, material science. It can be used in really any uh, application that you want. Um, but for us, we've written it to run with uh, Atomate in terms of material science uh, and VASP calculations. Um, and so what we can do is we can interface with these using uh, a second soft or third software package called Custodian. And this really lets us run VASP, QCHEM, uh, FEF, uh, LAMPS at, on supercomputers. And it deals with errors and handling of errors. So maybe you're running a calculation on VASP and you aren't converged. Well, the, the um, Custodian software will automatically restart that job and try to get you that higher level of convergence that you actually need. Um, or it can say, OK, MPI failed. Why did it fail? And so it can give you a whole bunch of diagnostics. And for some of the simple errors, it'll just fix it for you. And you can just keep chugging along. So you don't have to worry about the nitty gritty of each of your calculations. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, base workflows in Atomate that allow you to compute a lot of pretty standard uh, materials properties. Um, these are things such as band structure, elastic tensor, Raman, and there's a bunch more. You can find those on uh, the Atomate website. And I've actually left a link in the workbook that we'll be working in um, w about this. And then with using Fireworks, we get a lot of access to job tracking and monitoring, as well as database storage of our calculations in our Mongo database. And we can pull these out at any time. And this really helps organize our data into something much better than you know, a tree of um, folders where we just write down where we kept our specific calculation, and we can try to pull it out later. Uh, so now let's begin our, uh, our workshop lesson. Um, so if you guys can open up the, uh, uh, the folder in um, Atomate, and it's called One Beginning Workflows Empty. Um, and as before, we have two versions of the notebook. We have one that's filled out and one that's not. So depending on what, what pace you want to work at, or if you get lost, you can refer back to the one that's already filled out. Right? And just to check, everyone can hear me OK, right? All right, great. OK. so. Let's start off. So the first thing we want to do, of course, is we want to make sure our uh, uh, API key is set. Um, the, it might be reset every time you boot up for this specific thing. Not something you have to do uh, typically, but I'll just run that. Um, and then we'll test whether or not the materials project uh, Atomate module is working by running it. And uh, it seems to not be throwing errors, so we're good to go. Um, OK, so the first thing we're going to do is uh, run a work or create a workflow and then analyze the different pieces of it. Um, and to start that, what we'll need is a structure. And so, as we learned in the API course um, that John taught, we can just use the materials project raster for that, right? So, we'll just go ahead and type into here um, from PyMatGen import MP raster. And then we can create an MP raster object like such. Then after we have that, we can just query for a structure. So let's just say we're going to do mpr.get structure. 
uh, by material ID, and we can use the tab complete to help that along. Um, MP27, so we'll just get 27. So this corresponds to our FCC silicon, um, and we're just gonna do an example calculation on this since it's pretty simple. And then let's just look at the output. So now we get the output, and we see that there's one silicon atom at zero, 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 and then we have the uh, lattice parameters for our silicon. So let's go ahead and assign this to a, just a structure variable. So struct is equal to mpr.getStructure by materials ID, and then we'll rerun that line. So now we have assigned struct to be uh, that structure that we pulled from the database. Okay? And so now to illustrate how easy it is to construct a workflow, I'll... Yeah. Does everyone have green? Okay, that's great. So if at any time you guys have trouble, just take down the green sticky note and then put up the red. Um, and then maybe at some point in time, I'll have some checkpoints. Okay. All right, so with that, I'll just continue on. Um, so. Here what we can do um, to access the workflows in Atomate is we want to import them. So we'll say from Atomate.vasp. So we're looking specifically for VASP workflows. Uh, VASP.workflows.presets.core uh, import. And then if we do tab autocomplete, we can see that there's a bunch of different workflows that we can uh, get. We have bulk modulus, elastic constant, NEB, Raman spectra. Um, specifically right now we're just looking for the structure optimization. So if we look for it, WF underscore structure optimization. We can just run that and now we've imported the base code for uh, the structure optimization workflow in materials project. And so what this will do is take our structure and refine the atomic coordinates as well as the uh, lattice vectors uh, to more, to lower the energy of the overall cell. Um, so to create the workflow, all we need to do is type uh, workflow is equal to workflow structure optimization. We can tab complete that, um, so we don't have to type the whole thing out, and then we can just give it a structure. And then if we look at some of the, oh, that's not gonna show, okay. If we look at the parameters that this, uh, function takes. All we need is a structure and some sort of configuration dictionary. So in the basic workflow, we don't need to give it any sort of configuration dictionary, but maybe we want to tailor this and add more K points. Then we can give it some sort of configuration, um, but at least for now, we don't need to deal with that because at its current level, it's already converged enough to be on the materials project. So if we run that, now we have that workflow. So let me just print what that workflow is. So let me get rid of this. Print, print WF. And then we can see that we have a workflow object and it's the dictionary of keys is just negative one because we haven't added it to our database yet. And then its name is just silicon because this is a silicon calculation, right? Okay. So now we can also print some more information on this workflow by typing workflow wf dot as dict. And this just looks at this workflow in a dictionary form, um, which I think we talked about a little bit in the past in our previous sections. Um, so basically it's just uh, a list of keys and uh, values. In this case, we have uh, keys such as fireworks. So what fireworks specifically are we running? I'll talk a little bit more about the structure of that in a second. Um, and then we can see things like the tasks that we need to run. So let's say the first thing is we need to write some files. Um, it, maybe that's input files. And then we need to write more input files. Then we can run VAS speci specifically using custodian right here. Um, then what we'll do is we'll try to give maybe any other fireworks that need some of this data, that information, and then finally we'll put this, the final outputs of our calculation into a database. Okay, so 
now let's add this to our database um, so that we can visualize it and actually start to run this. Um, so to do that, I need you to go back to the main directory um, and start up the fireworks data, uh, dashboard. So we'll go back to this um, Jupyter notebook section, which shows the folder view. And then we'll just click on new in this top right corner. And then if we go to fireworks, what we'll do is we'll open up our fireworks dashboard. So what this is doing is it's opening up a graphical user interface um, based off of our database of calculations, whether they're completed or pending, um, this is where they'll show. So you can see that there's nothing here. We have zero straight down the board, um, and everything is pretty much empty. Um, so now that we have this open, we can go ahead and go back and then add our stuff into this database. Um, so the, for the first thing we need to do is we need to first initialize it, because this is our first time using this uh, database. We'll want to reset it and just tune it up to make sure that it's uh, working good for what we need it to do. So to do that, let's say from fireworks uh, core, and then we want to do launch, launch pad, import launch pad. And so launch pad, there's, fireworks has this whole theme of fireworks, right? So you have a launch pad, you have fireworks that individually shoot up, and then a workflow is just a collection of fireworks. Um, so I spelled launchpad wrong here, so let's spell launchpad. And then what we can do is we can type LP is equal to launchpad.autoload. And what this is, will do is it'll automatically pull the configuration of that fireworks database that we just opened up. So we can hit run, that works fine. So maybe we can look at what LP is. So if you look at it, it's basically just um, a connection to a Mongo database that's called Materials Project Workshop. And then specifically, let's see, lp.db, um, you can see specifically uh, what's going on here. So it's just Materials Project Workshop uh, database. All right, is everyone still with me? Cool. So now let's reset this database. Um, and this is something that we really only want to do once which is at the very first creation of our database, um, or else we'll delete most of our uh, data on what runs we have in the pipeline or what runs have already completed. So let's type lp.reset. And then just for our purposes, let's give it a password. So it's asking us for a password. We'll just tell the uh, system that there's no password and then uh, require password is equal to false. And again, we can uh, tab autocomplete that. So if we run this, it's gonna say it's performing the database tune-up, um, and then finally it's going to uh, reset the launch pad. Uh, we're not gonna see anything change. Um, it should still be empty, so that we can just check that by refreshing, and it indeed is still empty, so great. So now let's actually add this to this workflow to our database. The way we do that is typing LP dot add, um, add workflow. So we'll click that and then just give it the arguments of our workflow. And then if we hit shift enter, now it says we've added our workflow. And it tells us that this negative one ID corresponds to one. So if we now open our fireworks dashboard again, and then refresh it. We can see now that we have one workflow here with the ID of one. So now if we wanna get more information about this workflow, what we can do is we can click on the name right here. So just SI and this big one in the top left corner. So if we click on it, we get some sort of map. In this case, we only have one firework, so it's only displaying one, and it's some uh, structure optimization. We can get information on when it was created, what its state is, and when it was last updated. Um, and then also, once we run this, you can get information on the directory in which your data is stored. So we can specifically click on the structure optimization back here. Um, so if we go back and then click on the firework, this blue guy is a firework, what we can see is that this firework is in a ready state, which means it's ready to be run. 
And what is it going to do? Well, we can see here a little bit more clearly what this firework is going to do. First, it's going to write a file that contains the information on this firework. Then we're going to write the, from the input set. Um, specifically, we're going to put down the structure, the k point file, the pot car file, and then um, the in car file. Um, so there's a set here. And then after that, we're going to run with these parameters. And then we're going to do some final things that deal with passing uh, calculations and putting things into the database, right? All right, so now let's look at something a little bit more complicated than just our simple one firework workflow. So let's add a few other workflows. Um, so I've just selected a few, um, and let's just type from atomate.vasp.workflows.presets.core import workflow. And so the ones that we're going to add um, are just going to be our elastic constant, uh, elastic constant, um, workflow bulk modulus. OK, this needs to go on the next line. Sorry, I'm just putting this on the next line so you guys can see it. And then finally, we're going to add a Gibbs free energy workflow, uh, which is Gibbs free energy. OK. So if we run those input imports, um, now we have those imported. And then finally, let's actually create these workflows. Again, very simple. We just give it a structure. So let's say elastic workflow is equal to workflow elastic constant. We give it a structure. And then we can uh, add the workflow, uh, elastic workflow. So same commands as before. If we hit Shift Enter, we can see now that we've added a workflow, and there's a lot of there's a lot more fireworks in this workflow, right? Um, may, let's go ahead and add the other one. So let's say maybe Gibbs uh, workflow is equal to workflow Gibbs free energy. Again, give it a structure, and then we'll add that to the launch pad lp.addWorkflow, Gibbs workflow. And we'll maybe add the next one, modulus uh, workflow is equal to uh, workflow bulk modulus. Give it a structure. And then we can just add that to our database. Um, OK. So pretty easy, right? So now we're able to create calculations that compute the bulk modulus or the Gibbs free energy just by typing three lines of code, right? So we imported it, we created it, and then we added it to our database. So let me run this. It's going to add two sets of workflows. And now what we can do is go back to our dashboard, reset it, and we can see that there's a lot more calculations here. So now what we get is a few different colors, right? So we can see blue is ready, but there's now this darker blue. And what that is is a waiting firework. It means that there's a dependency for that firework, and it can't run until the previous firework that solves that dependency is completed. So if we look specifically at this, let me fix my font here. Um, OK, let me reset, refresh this. Okay. So if we look at the structure of this workflow, what we can see is the first firework that's going to be run is just a structure optimization. So what that's going to do is uh, take our structure and refine it to be something that's a little bit more accurate. Um, and then what we do is we go into six deformations um, that correspond to different volume changes of our cell. That way we can get that elastic tensor. And then finally, you fit it, or this is a bulk modulus, sorry, um, so you can get the bulk modulus by varying the volume. Um, and then you fit an equation of state to it, um, and then you can calculate um, the bulk modulus. So maybe let's go into this fit equation of state. So this specifically isn't running VASP, but what it's doing is it's running Python. So fireworks don't have to only run VASP. They can run other pieces of code. Um, so one example might be, in this case, we're running Python. Another might be uh, the case where we're running FAF. Um, so Fireworks can be tailored um, and customized to what you need. So this, in this case, we're fitting to a, a Vignette equation of state, and then we can get the bulk modulus out of that. 
And then we can look at some of the other ones. We have here, maybe we're looking at this uh, Gibbs calculation. We again have a one dependency at the very top, which is our structure optimization, um, followed by some deformations. Um, and then you can calculate the fr Gibbs free energy here. Um, so what you'll notice is that most of these calculations start off with a structure optimization. And that's really because we want a very accurate structure um, before we go into the calculations so that we have a good starting ground um, before we start computing properties. And so that's, that's generally how this works. And you'll notice this one, again, is the same structure. Um, there's some with different structures, and we'll go over the band structure calculation, which has a different um, firework layout than these three that we've added. OK, so now that we've added a whole bunch of workflows, let's talk about how we would monitor other than looking at this graphical interface. Maybe looking at the GUI isn't your cup of tea. Maybe you're that command line hacker and you just want to look at everything there. Or you want a little bit more power and you want to use Python to look at it. How do we actually do that? So let's type out a command. So if we look at LP, which is our launch pad, um, this actually keeps track of all our workflow and firework information. So we can type lp.get, uh, let's do tab complete, um, get workflow IDs. Or no, sorry, that's not what I wanted to type. Um, get workflow summary. Dic so a dictionary that summarizes the workflow. We'll give it the ID 1 just to look at the first one. And we'll press Shift Enter. So now what this tells me um, is the same information we got previously, which is that we have uh, one workflow that's in the ready state. It's a structure optimization. And this is when it was created. So now we can also look at maybe the second workflow. So let's press Shift Enter. Now we can see this is our elastic deformations uh, workflow, so our uh, elastic tensor calculation workflow. And then maybe let's look at three. Oh, it's still our elastic deformation workflow, right? So the way that Fireworks generates workflow IDs is just strictly based off of uh, the firework IDs. So I notice in this workflow, I have 23, uh, 23, 24 uh, fireworks. And what happens is that those are numbered 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to 26. So if I type any of those IDs, I'm going to still reference the workflow um, that corresponds to this elastic deformation. If I now change this to 27, what we'll see is it's, it's still this one. Oh, right. So I missed this one down here, 27. So let's go 28. So this one should pull up a different workflow. Right. So now we're looking at the Gibbs deformation workflow. OK. So now what if we don't necessarily know what the workflow ID is? Well, we can get a list of workflow IDs just by typing lp.get uh, workflow IDs. And it'll tell us the first ID. Uh, of every single workflow. So one corresponds to the first one, two corresponds to the second one, and then of course anything 2 to 28 corresponds to that first one, and then 28, and then 51. Okay? So now let's start to use Python and kind of get a little bit more into something um, where maybe we want more control of what we're printing out, right? We don't want to print out all of this stuff maybe. Um, so let's start with something basic like uh, defining a function that gets workflows. So we'll call it get workflows. We'll define it as a function. And then here what we'll do is we'll just type some code, right? So we got some uh, workflow IDs previously. So let's just go through each of these and then print out some information. So let's say for workflow ID in lp.get workflow IDs. So what we're doing is we're iterating through the list of workflow IDs. What we're going to do is for key comma value in lp.get workflow summary dictionary. And then we'll just give it workflow ID, which is similar to what we did above, but now we're putting it into a function. And then we'll just get all the items from this. And then we can print our key, and then maybe a colon to separate it. 
and then I value, value. So the key and the value. So because this is a dictionary, we're going to get keys and values, and we can print those out. And then just to clean things up, we'll just print a new line um, between everything. So now that we've defined that function, we can run that function. So now get workflows. Um, we'll just call that function directly. And then if we press Shift Enter, we can see something similar to what we got before, where we just printed the state and whatnot of the firework. So one thing we can do is maybe I want to skip the launch directories, or maybe I want to skip the states. So I can just say, uh, let's see, if key is equal to states, we'll just, oops, my bad. We'll just continue, continue. OK, so now if I run that, oops, sorry. Move that down. Um, now, if I run this work, this uh, function again, it's going to skip printing out the states, right? So now maybe we've eliminated a lot of stuff here. Uh, maybe we want something a little bit more compact, so we can just copy and paste this down here, and maybe change this to um, launchers. So maybe we don't want to print out the launch directories. So we add that. P a uh, bit of code, and then we run it, and then now we've got something that's a little bit more clean. Um, maybe I didn't care about the launch directories because it's just a pile of uh, strings that I don't care about. So now that we've customized that. So now let's look at the fireworks individually. Here I think we have a little bit more room um, to show a lot of stuff because there's a lot more fireworks in our database, right? Um, so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to write a function. Um, that just gets uh, fireworks. And so at this point, I can talk about the states of the fireworks. So um, going back here, we've talked about the ready state and the waiting state for fireworks. But you see there's a lot more. Um, so there's a few different states you can put your fireworks into, depending on what you want them to do. So if you set a firework to archived, you can actually put it away. This is something that you don't plan on running, but you want to keep track of um, the fact that you've run it. Um, then we have fizzled right here, um, which is basically a failed state. So when a firework fizzles, it fails to launch or fails to complete. Um, and so that's another state. And workflows can be in this too. We can have diffused or paused, which both of these are similar to, let's say, I temporarily don't want to run this. There's something higher in priority that I really want to look at before I get back to looking at this, I can pause my fireworks or diffuse them. Um, we have reserved, which means it's specifically designated to run on a specific uh, compute node on some high-performance computing machine. We have, of course, running, which is something that's in the process of running. And then we have our completed fireworks. And we'll, we can look into this a little bit later. Um, but specifically for this, I'm going to get all the workflows that aren't diffused, paused, or archived. So basically, I want to look at only the fireworks that I'm interested in. So let's type this out. So for firework ID in lp.getFirework_ids. So we're just getting all of the firework IDs in our database. Um, what we'll want to do is we'll want to do fw is equal to lp get firework dict by ID. So again, same thing as before, but we're doing this for fireworks. We're getting information on that firework. Give it firework ID. And then what we can do is maybe if uh, firework state um, is in the list of diffused, paused, or archived, what we want to do is just continue. We don't want to deal with printing out any information regarding those. And then finally, we can say for property, so for prop in uh, firework ID updated, updated on state, oh, state and name. Um, what we'll do is we'll print that property, followed by a semicolon, 
and then um, just a firework of uh, property. And then we'll print that new line um, just to clean things up. So what this is saying is, if my firework is not paused, diffused, or archived, what we'll do is we'll print out the firework ID when it was last updated, um, its state, and its name. So we'll run that. And then, OK, I need to add another line. So I just press A there. And then we can do uh, just run this function, get fireworks. And now we can see that we're printing out everything that's waiting uh, or ready. So we have fireworks 1, 2, 4. One, two, three, four, all the way up to, I think we have 90, no, we definitely only have 58 fireworks. Okay. So, the, and then there's our uh, 58 fireworks. And that's the state. Okay. So now that's how we do this in Python. Um, I'll briefly cover how you do this in command line, but for people who love using the command line, um, you can get more information by typing lpad uh, dash dash help in your terminal. And so if you remember, the way we run terminal commands in um, the Jupyter Notebook is just having that exclamation point. So what we'll do is type our exclamation point right here. And then we can type lpad get workflow uh, wflows dash i1. So we're going to get um, the workflow with id1. We hit shift enter, and it'll tell us the state of the firework is uh, ready, its name is silicon one, it's created on this date, and then its uh, state is ready. And we can also do that with fireworks, so we can do um, lpad, exclamation point lpad, get fireworks, dash i, maybe let's do 30, we'll hit shift enter, and it'll say firework i, or sorry, firework 30, is currently in the waiting state, and this is the name of that firework. And then, as I mentioned before, we can get more information by typing lpad um, dash dash help. And then we can see a lot more of the commands that we can run, right? So we can do things like get fireworks, track fireworks, rerun, archive, delete, um, and these are all things that might come in handy um, that we also have access to in Python. So it's whichever one you prefer. And then let's see, so now let's say we have a specific command that we want to use. Maybe we want to use uh, delete the workflows. So let's type exclamation point lpad delete delete workflows dash dash help. And then if we run that, Fireworks will tell us a little bit more about how you do this. Maybe in certain cases, if you've set up a password, you're going to need a password to delete some of the workflows, especially if you ha are trying to delete more than 10 workflows at once. Um, and then, or you could specify by firework ID, name, whatever. So that's, that's a pretty powerful way of looking at things if you're really into the command line. Or else I would suggest probably just use uh, the Python interface, because that's pretty clean too. <coughs> OK. So finally, let's try running this, uh, that first workflow that we added. Um, but we added a bunch, three other workflows that we don't really need to run right now. So let me just um, get rid of those. So the way we'll do that is just to get workflow IDs. So oh, my bad. Run that function. So what we're going to try to do is delete 2, 28, and 51. So let's just do um, 4i in. Maybe we assign this to a variable, IDs is equal to that. Um, for i in uh, IDs, we'll just skip the first one and then just go onwards from there. We'll just diffuse those, lp dot diffuse workflow, and we'll just diffuse that i workflow. Right. So now if we look back at our fireworks dashboard and reset it, we can see now that all our fireworks in these first in these last three fire, uh, workflows are now set to the diffuse state. So now these won't run. And then you can see that over here, they've correspondingly been put into the uh, diffused state. So these are things that maybe we will get to later. But for right now, we don't really want to use them. And then let's test our function get fireworks. Um, now we're only printing out the ready um, or waiting or our active fireworks, right? 
So now let's, let's get into running this workflow. So the way that we do this is uh, by launching our rocket. And we can do this by importing from Fireworks, from Fireworks uh, Core Rocket Launcher, more Fireworks terminology, I guess. Uh, import launch, launch rocket. So we want to launch a rocket which, is, which contains a firework, right? So now we can run that. So now we've imported that command. Um, but first, what we'll want to do is make a directory um, to run this in. So let's just import OS, which gives us functionality to create uh, folders or look at different things within our um, computer. So import OS. And then let's just um, type os.makeDERS, uh, make DERS. Um, and then we'll make this directory, tilde slash uh, mp workshop slash fake vasp slash, oh, yeah, calc dir. So what we're going to do is we're just going to run this in a specific uh, directory. In this case, I've called it fake vasp because what we'll actually do is we'll talk about why we need to use fake vasp. Um, basically, it comes down to licensing issues. We can't get each one of you a license to run vasp. So we, in this case, just want to simulate running it. So we've pre-run all of the VASP calculations. And so what you'll be doing is just um, simulating your run by pulling uh, those output files that we've already ran. Um, so we'll make that directory. And then we'll change our directory, so os.chdir. And then I'm just going to copy this so I don't have to type it over again um, here. So now we're just going to change the directory in which we're actually working in into this uh, calculation directory that we've created. OK? Now, finally, to uh, launch this rocket, we'll just type launch rocket, which is the function that we've imported. And then we'll just give it, let's see, a launch pad, right? So all it cares about is uh, having a launch pad. The other uh, arguments are optional. So we'll just give it LP. Oh, that's not what I want to do. Do LP. We hit Shift Enter, and now it says it's launching the rocket and it's trying to run it. So it's going through each of the individual tasks that we talk about, um, and then um, now it says it's finished. Except the issue is that it threw an error, right? So right now it's basically the error here is related to the fact that we don't actually have fireworks set up, or sorry, VASP set up. Um, so there's no way we can actually run a VASP calculation. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and let's, I guess, check this, get fireworks. And we can see that it's in a fizzled state, which means it failed. Again, if we go to the launch pad and reset it, we can see now we have one red firework, which is now in its fizzled state, right? Um, so let's go ahead and fix this. Um, and let's do this by... Um, setting up fake VASP. So I've already pre-put this code in because this isn't something that you'll need to do later on. So I think it's OK if you guys don't type this out. But basically, what we're doing is we're looking in the uh, MP Workshop repo and looking specifically at Atomate and getting the structure optimization path. Um, so if we run this one, we can see that this is the location for where we've put our pre-run VASP calculation for uh, our silicon structure optimization. And then what we can do is we can import Atomate power up called um, use fake VASP. So basically, it just simulates using it just by copying over the files. Um, and so we'll just give it a workflow. Um, and then we'll give it a reference directory, which is our structure optimization path that we uh, loaded here. So if we run that, now we have that workflow. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add this workflow to our uh, launchpad, lp.add workflow, um, workflow. So now if we get fireworks, we have our fizzled firework, and then we have our ready firework, right? So here now we have our ready firework. So now this is ready to use fake bass. So let's rerun that calculation. Um, and see what the outputs are, or if it finishes. So let's type launch, pad, launch rocket, give it the launch pad. And then if we type 
hit shift enter. Now it tries to run um, the firework. Now it says that we're running fake VASP. It verified the input successfully. Um, and it ran fake VASP, and then now it did all this stuff corresponding to processing the output and putting it into um, our VASP database. And we'll talk a little bit more about the VASP database in the next section that Jimmy's going to teach, um, so I'm not really going to touch over it here. So now we can see how our fireworks change, get fireworks. And now we have a fizzled and a completed uh, firework. So again, if we move back into our fireworks dashboard and then refresh it, we can again see that we've completed um, a firework. And then here we can also see diagrams of uh, the fact that we have one fizzled and uh, one completed firework. One thing that you can do, let's say if you're running high throughput and you have like 5,000 calculations that you're working on, maybe you want to get a uh, report of the past 24 hours, what's happening. You can go ahead and click that report in the bottom right corner of that main page. Sorry, I went through that a little fast. So under summary reports, maybe you want to click 24 hours. And then it'll break it down by hour. It'll tell us uh, we have one fizzled firework, one completed firework, and then our uh, total uh, completion rate is 50%. And maybe you have some sort of threshold before you start going and, and doing some error checking and figuring out what's going wrong. So now that we have that, um, let's talk about how we run multiple fireworks at once. Um, so maybe this is the high throughput case where we have multiple fireworks. How do we actually deal with that? So I'm just going to add that previous um, firework or workflow in multiple times. So I'll just type that, copy and paste it three times. So now we can add it three different times. Um, so we have three different copies of it. Again, you probably won't be doing this every day. There's no use to run one calculation three times. You're not going to expect a different result. But in our case, we'll just do it for demonstration. Um, so after we add these workflows um, three times, we can just check our dashboard. And now we can see we have three ready fireworks. And so the way that we run lots of fireworks at once is by using a rapid fire. So uh, by running one at a time, we only did a single shot. Now what we're going to do is we're going to launch rapid fire. So we'll just import again from fireworks, fireworks.core.rocketlauncher, import rapid fire. And now we can run the same command um, or use it in the same way. Um, so we say rapid fire and then give it some launch pad. Uh, shift tab is not working. Um, but basically it only t it takes a launch pad and maybe a fire worker, but we're not going to talk about that. So if we hit shift enter, it's going to try to run these. Um, and right now you can see a log of this um, as it goes. So right now it's verified the input successfully. And then it's going to go into actually um, running the calculation and put that in quotes. Um, and then it's going to put things into the database. So if we look at our dashboard, we can see now one was running. Um, maybe we keep refreshing it. Now it's completed. The next one is running. Um, and so on and so forth. And this, what this rapid fire will do is it'll keep running the fireworks until we've run out of fireworks to run. So let me just keep refreshing. We can wait for this. I think there's maybe a little bit of a delay in copying. Yes, that's also possible. Um, so I guess for now, take my word. What will happen is um, this running will turn into completed, and the same for this one. Um, yeah, just like that. So now that's how we launch fireworks from our Jupyter notebook. but. How would you do it if you want to use a queue on like a high performance computing machine, right? Maybe you're using NERSC, or you have one at your local school that you're trying to work on, or maybe your company has one. Um, well, what you want to do is you'll want to use a queue launcher. And specifically, what this will do is it'll generate all the submission files that are needed to submit to many of the uh, basic. Um, high-performance computing management softwares like Slurm 
or uh, Moab or Torque. I think those two are the same thing. And so the way that we do that, um, we'll get into it after we create another workflow. Um, pretty simple workflow. Um, we're just going to do a band structure calculation. So we'll say from Atomate dot vasp dot workflows dot presets dot core Im import wf band structure and then what we can do is we can make this workflow workflow is equal to wf band structure and then this one again only takes a uh, structure so let's give it a struct so if we hit shift enter, now we've created the workflow. Um, but again, what we need to do is we need to use fake VASP because we don't have VASP licenses for everyone. So we'll just hit shift enter on the next cell, which basically just sets up all of the paths necessary um, for, um, for the calculation. And then what we did was we added it to our uh, workflow, our, our launch pad. So let's go ahead and go back to that launch pad, refresh. Now we can see everything else is completed and we have this ready firework or workflow. This one's a little bit different. As I mentioned earlier, if you look at it, it's got a different structure, right? So we have a structure optimization, which usually always happens first. Then we do a static calculation and then we do a, uh, what does that sound for? A, uh, an SCF stands for non-self-consistent, non right? My bad. Um, and so we have one that's uniform, so this would get us our density of states, and then we have a line which uh, would give us our uh, band structure diagram, because we'd go along uh, lines between k points. Um, so that's how that works, and then if you wanted, you can click on each individual one and get more information about what that specific firework is doing. All right, so now let's, I'm gonna delete all these extra lines. Um, Let's actually launch this into a queue. So what we have set up is a Slurm queue. Um, so basically this is gonna simulate how you would run on many of the uh, popular uh, large supercomputers. So Slurm manages um, different jobs and it's, it's a job scheduler. So if 20 people in this room submit a job, it has to figure out which ones to run when and how to optimize the runtime so that you maximize the use of whatever supercomputing resource you have. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. And the way you do that is uh, through the command line. So what we need to do is type exclamation point, Q launch, dash R, let me move this up a little bit, dash R, rapid fire. And then we're going to say N uh, launches, launch is, launches, I can't spell and launches one. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna send one job into our Slurm queue. Um, and so what we do when we hit shift enter. So now what, we sit, what this is saying is it's launched one job successfully into our Slurm job queue. Okay. Um, so now the supercomputer will take care of running that. So maybe if we go back and monitor, we can see, okay, it ran and it completed, um, and now it's waiting for the next firework. So if we look back here at the architecture of our workflow, what we see is that we have our structure optimization, it completed, and now our static calculation is ready to run. Since its previous dependency, which was the structure optimization, uh, completed successfully, we can now run this. And we can see that these two are still waiting. Um, so let's go ahead and run the next few. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna launch just a multitude of jobs into the queue. So let's type exclamation point queue launch uh, dash r rapid fire. And since we didn't specify the number of launches, it'll just run or send as many jobs into the queue as we have fireworks in our database. So we'll just hit shift enter. And now it's going to submit the first job. And then it's gonna sleep for five seconds. And it says we finished a round of launches. So basically, because we only have one firework that's ready to run, it's only gonna send one job into the queue. And then after 60 seconds, um, it's going to try to do the submission process again. 
Um, so maybe you could keep this running in the background and as you submit jobs, maybe over the next week, um, this will automatically submit those jobs. So you don't have to think about running your jobs, you only have to think about putting them into your database and then letting them run on their own. So maybe we'll go back, refresh. We can see now that since the static firework has completed, now we have opened up the possibility to run our uniform and line uh, calculations. So let's give this a second. It's still waiting for 60 seconds. Um, sometime soon, soon it should start to try to run the next firework. All right, so now it submitted another job, so a job ID four. And then finally it submitted another job and then it's gonna wait another five seconds. And then what is it gonna tell me? Give it a second. What does reserved mean? So reserved means that it's reserved to run on a, a supercomputer. So when a firework is about to be run, it'll be set to the reserve state. So no other node can pull that information and run that job a second time. Okay. So it's basically preventing parallel errors. Um, oh, okay, so this finished. So basically what it said is um, there's nothing else in the database, so now we're going to complete this. I don't even need to try to run any waiting fireworks because there's none. So I refresh this, and now we can see this one's still running because it was in the queue. And let's see, all right, now uh, we've finished that, so it's right there. Okay, so now if we again use our function that we wrote, get fireworks, we can see now that we have, of course, our first failed attempt at running VASP, and then we have a subsequent, I think, eight calculations that successfully completed. And with that, you have successfully run some calculations. And so the overarching theme here is that it doesn't take much to run a calculation because most of what we've done is built in the expertise of running band structure calculations. You don't have to think about the complexities of using or writing input files for VAS, which can be a little bit complicated because um, you have to think about things like k-point density, energy cutoff, you need to think about um, what precision you want to use, and just so many factors that it takes a lot of time to get into it. Whereas this, it's pretty simple. Most people can jump right into it, and uh, you can start getting uh, calculations out. Yeah, so you can do that. So let me go into the um, Atomate documentation. So let me just pull up Atomate, and we'll just go look specifically closer at our specific, um, sorry, I forgot to change the font back. I hope you guys could see this whole time. So let me just look at our workflows, and specifically the ones that we used. Um, so presets core, so if you look at the structure, it's pretty much what we did our, in our input from Atomate VASP dot workflows dot presets dot core import. Um, and then we can look at something like a band structure. So in our configuration, we can say, maybe if we want to add more K points, we can um, set a flag that's uh, a small gap K point multiply. So maybe we want a higher K point density for something like that. Um, and then we can also add some other things. And each, each workflow is different. Uh, another thing is if you want to get a little bit more into the uh, nitty gritty of things, maybe you want a little bit more customization, you don't have to use that preset firework. You can just go into um, these core calculations, so just workflow base. Um, so these are pretty much um, what we rely on to, let's see, is that here? No, it's not here. Where is this? It's workflows. It's under base. Um, well, okay, let's just look in this case at maybe something like bulk modulus. Bulk modulus, if we want within um, PyMatGen, what we can do is give it a structure, and if we've pre-calculated our deformation matrices, 
um, we can give that to it. So maybe if you have a specific set of deformations you want to look at, you can do that. You can change the equation of state, um, give it different uh, VAS commands, and then you see this tag right here, which is user in-car settings. So in VASP, you have an in-car, which specifies things like K points and whatnot. Um, and so here you can change this, maybe, um, and this is something you'd have to look a little bit more into PyMatGen on, but you can change different flags like uh, EDIF or K points, um, and this will correspond to your VASP set um, on what happens. And sorry, so the K points is under user K point settings. Um, so you can change those that way. So, question. What is the easiest way just to see what the settings are in these pre-built workflows? The easiest way to see what these settings are. So, ooh, um, it's it's a little bit difficult to answer that. But let's say you're doing a standard um, like band structure or static. So, say static or optimization calculation. What you can do is you can look in um, PyMatGen GitHub. So, GitHub.com/slash/materials project slash pymatgen. Um, and what you can do is you can look at the specific sets. So the pre, the sets, let's see, they're in IO, VASP. So if you look specifically at the sets, there's a bunch of different sets that correspond to uh, different VASP inputs. Um, let's see, there's, uh, we can start with, this one, which is not what I'm looking for. So they're in PyMatGen, not in animation. Yeah, so we, basically all the processing happens in PyMatGen. That's where most of the material science is done. Um, Atomate just pulls together different functions from different codes, which are Fireworks and Custodian and PyMatGen, to allow you to run these calculations. Um, so one thing I can do is look at the configuration. So let's say for your standard materials project uh, relaxation calculation, you can see the different uh, in-car settings. So maybe you're using uh, these EDIF values and this NCUT values. And then if you have any LDA, LDAU uh, corrections and whatnot. And, so, and then these are the pot cars that you'd be using. Yeah, Jimmy. So, so, so I think the, the exact uh, PyMatch setting for each firework is recorded inside of the disk for the firework. So if, so if you So that is true to a case, I think, or to a certain extent. So right here, you can see that right here, it's just using the MP relax set. So you would have to go back to PyMatGen to look at that. But after you complete the calculation, you can actually look in your database and check which calculation or which specific um, VASP flags it used, um, and it keeps a detailed list of that so that you can re replicate that calculation in the future. Yeah. All right, does anyone have any questions? I think we've covered pretty much all the material um, that I have for you guys. I think we may have gone a little bit fast. Yes, question. So if you're using the, the Q, yeah. the Q um, I'm guessing there's a flag that we can set to, uh, to get a certain number of nodes or cores that you are using on it. Right, um, so yeah, there, there is something with that. So when you're running on a supercomputer, you have to write a file in Fireworks, and it's called a queue adapter. So what it does here, let me just pull up the basic. We could also show the Fireworks config in the source. The what? We could also show the Fireworks config in the source. Where? There is specific files that are Oh, this. OK, yeah. Okay, here, I'll just go into the Fireworks GitHub. That's the easiest place for me. Slash materials project slash fireworks. So if you look at the Fireworks um, user objects queue adapters folder, let's say that you're using Slurm, what you have is you have a whole bunch of um, commands. So this builds a input file for you um, based off of what you want. So you can specify the number of nodes, the number of tasks, uh, the task per core, et cetera. Um, and this is how you would specify, let's say I want 64 nodes uh, running for 10 hours um, to complete my job. And then you have different constraints here. 
Um, and this is just a template for it. If you want to know more about how to install Fireworks, um, you can go to the uh, Fireworks guide, and then it tells you how to write this input or this configuration file that would have these values plugged in. So yeah. Do we have any other questions? I do believe it's probably a little bit early for coffee break. Yeah, question. So that um, last command, Q launch, right. the fire, mm -hmm. that has to keep running. So, so if I log into a to remote server, yeah. I'm restarting that command, but as long as if I log out, it, it, it stops there. Right? right, so the way that you would do that, uh, work around that is you could use um, some sort of uh, screen. So what screen does is it creates just a uh, instance of uh, or a session on your uh, HPC that persists even after you log out. Um, so if you were to log into, maybe I can show you real quick. So maybe if I SSH onto some supercomputer. Uh, let me just type in my credentials. Uh, okay, so I hope you can see this. Um, but what you can do is, let me just activate my environment. So you can create persistent screens just by typing something like uh, screen. So if you create a screen, you can see that this opens up a different session. So let's say we want Q, la Q launch rapid fire. So let me activate my environment here. Uh, give it a second. All right, well, I guess that doesn't really matter. So let's, let's say now we've run, tried to run something. Maybe this is the output. We can actually leave the screen. Oh, I just deleted it. Yeah, let me try to do that. Um, let's see. Preferences. Appearance. Okay, just can do command plus. Okay, so we've created our screen. Maybe we run some commands. Uh, LPAD, get, fireworks. Okay, so I didn't activate fireworks, but let's just leave the screen. So now what we can do is we can just do a screen attach. Is it attach? Yeah. Uh, no. What? It's screen what? I don't use screen that often. Uh, oh, screen dash R. So it reattaches. That's right. Um, and so we see this is the same output. So again, if we leave this by pressing command AD, we can exit our supercomputer, so now I'm back on my uh, MacBook, but then I can SSH back onto the system, and then I can just do uh, screen-r as well, and then we can see that this session is still persistent, right? Um, so what we can do is we can run our qlaunch command within this screen, and it'll just persist on this uh, machine until we uh, end it, or until it's, the system is restarted. Yeah. So it's pretty useful. Do we have any other questions? Yes, questions. Let's say you have a bunch of workflows mm -hmm. going, but let's say you just want to stop them. How do you actually kill the workflows? So how do you kill the workflows? Um, so what you can do is you can defuse the workflows, or you can archive the workflows, or pause the workflows. Um, and so the way you could do that, so let me just type in the command, is you would type LP. And then you can do something like um, defuse workflow, and then maybe give it an ID. And what that'll do is, no matter what the state of the workflow is, it'll just set all of the fireworks to diffused, and so they won't be run. Um, so things that are completed will stay completed just because they've already run. There's no use in uh, changing those status. But if something's running, what will happen is um, it'll be set to a diffuse state, but the supercomputing uh, resources that you have won't actually know that that firework has been canceled. So what it'll do is it'll continue to run that firework or that calculation, and then when it, when it finishes, it'll try to update the database and say, oh, okay, this was uh, diffused, and it won't 
actually put the data into the uh, database. Yeah. Can you use the queue to, uh, I guess, also kill the job from the server itself? Uh, yeah, you'd have to do that specifically on Slurm. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there a way I can see what kinds of workflows the materials project is running? The materials project. Oh yeah. So if you're interested, uh, it's so the the materials project is doing a whole bunch of calculations, right? So you'll see a very cluttered uh, database. It's dashboard. Dot materials project. Dot org, right? No, 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 no. Fireworks. 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 Okay. Fireworks. Dot dash. Dot materials project dot org. Okay, so let me change my font again. Uh, so here you can see directly uh, what's going on in the materials project. So we recently did some calculations, structure optimizations on uh, these compounds over here. I'm not going to attempt to name all of them because that's probably just going to go badly. Um, but we can see here that there's a whole bunch of fireworks, so maybe we have a total of uh, 163,000 calculations, um, 120,000 of those have completed, and then we have 3,700 3, in the waiting pipeline. Um, and maybe if we look over the past 24 months, what's been going on here, we can see, let's say, in uh, July, we completed roughly 2,300 uh, fireworks, and we have 18 uh, that failed. Um, so that's pretty good. That's 99% completion rate. Um, and you can see all that plotted here. And that's, this is the machinery behind the materials project, one part of the machinery. Uh, what we have is additional set of builders that aggregate this data from the materials uh, database and puts it onto the website directly, or that the website can pull from. Yeah, basically. This isn't everything, like we have separate for the elasticity workflows right. and all just the core stuff. Right, yeah, so as Donnie said, this is just the core uh, structure optimization, but we also have um, different uh, dashboards for elasticity calculation, NMR, and different properties, uh, just to keep it clean and separate, yeah. All right, and you have any questions? If not, I believe we can just let out and uh, go get some coffee and stuff. Yeah. Ah, right, yes. Um, so again, we're going to have a poll everywhere. Uh, just EV. Yeah. Okay, so let's do poll ev.com slash materials project workshop. Okay, so just if you want to give us some uh, feedback on this lesson, maybe did you like it, did you not like it, did we go too fast, too slow? Um, maybe something that you wanted me to talk about that I didn't talk about, um, you can add it here. Um, also, if you want to come talk. Also, say you can put any name, so it's okay to be anonymous. Right, yeah, so I, right now I'm responding as Rocky Raccoon, so maybe I hated the lesson. Um, <laughs> yeah, so maybe I'll just submit this. Um, Please don't submit that if you actually don't believe it, but uh, now that's, that's in the thing. So yeah, it's anonymous, so if you didn't like it, feel free to say that. I won't know, and I won't hate you either. Um, we're always looking to improve this year to year, so yeah. Yeah. any feedback you can give is definitely appreciated. All right, with that, I think we can go get coffee and like little snacks. Thank you, guys. And if you have any questions, just feel free to come talk to me or any other of the MTs.